I'm Zivy Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Please sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com for updates on podcast guests and lots of live events. Hi, everybody. I hope this week you'll check out We Found Time, my new online magazine, where we have essays this week by bestselling author Jill Santopolo, who wrote The, the Light We Lost. It's about her working out. V.C. Chickering. Allison Kane, Melissa Schultz, and Ashley Prentice Norton, um, who wrote The Chocolate Money, which I loved. They have written five amazing, beautiful essays, and you should go check them out at wefoundtime.com. This week's sponsor I'm really excited about is Peeled Snacks, and I've been buying Peeled Snacks for a long time, so I'm super excited they want to be a sponsor. My particular favorites are the apple gently dried fruits, but I'm also now obsessed with the salty snacks they have, particularly um, the baked pea crisps in sea salt flavor, which are delicious and amazing to have stocked now in the midst of this pandemic because they're healthy and um I don't feel guilty giving them to the kids. Uh, The fruits, too, are made with no added sugars, so that also makes me feel good since I alternate those with Fruit Loops. Anyway, Peeled Snacks is giving my listeners, that means you, a discount code of 15% off the entire purchase for just this week. And the discount code is capital Z for Zibby15. So go to Peeled Snacks, Zibby15. You get 15% off. Stuck up on some of these awesome, healthy dried fruits and salty snacks. By the way, the baked pea, beet pea puffs, butter and sea salt are also really awesome. Um, so you'll know what I'm snacking on and we can snack together. Thanks so much to Field Snacks for being a sponsor. I'm excited to be here today with Emily Gould, who's the author of Perfect Tunes, a novel. She also wrote the books And the Heart Says Whatever and Friendship. She contributed to many anthologies and runs Emily Books, an imprint of Coffeehouse Press, which publishes books by women. She's a contributor to Book Forum and The Cut. She teaches writing in New York City, where she lives with her family. Welcome, Emily. Thanks for coming on Mom's No Time to Read Books. Thanks so much for having me. (laughs) Can you please tell listeners what Perfect Tunes is about? Perfect Tunes is the story of a mother and daughter who are very close in age because uh, Laura, the protagonist of the book, got pregnant with Marie, her daughter, when she was in her very early 20s. And the circumstances of... That pregnancy and Marie coming into Laura's life really changed the course of what she thought her life was going to be like. Laura moved to New York, as many people do, with big dreams of being, in her case, a singer-songwriter. And she she is someone who has a lot of a lot of talent and not a lot of, I guess, ambition in terms of figuring out how to get her talent out there. And she falls in really quickly with a group of people, including the man who ends up being Marie's father, who are much more driven, much more ambitious, and much more sort of savvy in the ways of the big city than she is. Dylan, especially, is like a rock star, someone who's at the beginning of what seems like it's going to be a stratospheric career. Unfortunately, minor spoiler, but it happens at the yeah, very it's beginning so of the early. Book. It's okay. Um, and it's also, I think, in the jacket copy, so <laughs> I'm not actually spoiling anything. But Dylan dies unexpectedly and suddenly, and Laura then finds out that she's pregnant and just feels obligated to continue with the pregnancy and bring this child into the world because she's so in love with Dylan and feels like this is the last trace of him in this world. So all of that burgeoning talent and all of that, all of those artistic dreams get pushed to the margins of her life while she focuses on, you know, raising her daughter and surviving as a single mom. And then the latter part of the book deals with Marie coming of age, being a teenager and fighting with her mom, really hating her mom and wanting to know more about her dad's family. Hi, Jinx and Sue. Well done. (laughs) Thanks. I'm trying to keep it, figure out a way to keep it shorter than that, but you know. No, that was great. (laughs) I mean, that's really, I mean, that was, yeah, there we go. And uh, now pick up your copy and uh, see you later. No, I'm kidding. Right on. (laughs) (laughs) So how did you, how did you come up with this idea? What made you want to write about these characters in particular, this situation? Well, it's funny when I did the first draft of the book that would become Perfect Tunes, I was just obsessed with the idea of what if you could meet your mother as she was before she became your mother. 
And the first draft of this book, I was really trying to tackle that in a very literal way, mm-hmm. like involving time travel. <laughs> and I wrote it, I wrote an entire, well, almost a full draft and then realized, you know, I just don't have, I don't have whatever it takes to play with rules of reality. I'm really at this stage in my writing life better at just writing a straightforward realist novel that takes place in chronological order and doesn't mess with the laws of the space-time continuum. Yeah. 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 And I, yeah, so once I accepted that I just, like, wasn't pulling off the time travel, that it was always going to be ridiculous no matter how hard I tried to take it seriously as I was writing it, I had to throw out basically an entire draft, like, almost almost a whole book that I'd written. And it was a terrible moment, like a terrible day. My writing group, um, who I've, we meet and have been meeting for years and years, like almost a little more than a decade, I think. They were very gentle, but they did guide me toward that decision. And I'm super grateful because then what I was able to do is sort of pick up the pieces, take the characters who at that point really existed in my mind and some of the places where they'd been and the things they'd experienced and then just sort of put them together in a context that didn't involve ayahuasca-aided time travel, which is (laughs) something that happened in the first draft. So, yeah, I feel like I dodged a bullet, but it was a dark, it was a dark moment for sure. So what did you, like, what did you tell yourself when you like open the document to start over and like cut, did you like select all and just press the delete button and like, or did you start a new draft? I'm like envisioning you at your computer. Like, where were you? Were yeah. you home? Were you? No, I, I think I was at the, I think I was at the library. You know, it was during the days also really early in my older son's life, my first child, where I wasn't getting much writing time and every little scrap of time I was so precious because it really felt like it would, I would never be able to have big mm-hmm. stretches of time again. And, and also I was so conscious of how much I was paying to have that time. And it felt very, very pressured. And I just had to, like you said, you know, I had to reframe <laughs> and think of my life, my writing life, my career really as a long game. You know, try not to think about like, am I being maximally productive on this day, during this week, during this month, during this year of my life? And think more of, you know, this is a book. Books take four or five years. I mean, for me, mm-hmm. for many people, I think that's that's like a pretty normal like book metabolism to have. And so this is part of that four or five year chunk of my life. This is just the first part of it. Yeah. But it's, it's hard in the day to day to just go home and just feel like you have accomplished not even nothing, but like negative anything <laughs> but <laughs> to be in the hole. Yeah. Not to sound like Pollyanna-ish about it, but... I feel like you have to go through those drafts. Like, if you don't, then you won't get to the the, the final draft. Like, everybody keeps saying, like, I, they have to throw everything away and what a loss. And yet, sometimes that's, it's not negative. It, yeah. It, it was required to get here. It's so corny. It's I know, such, it is corny. Such, I know, no, I'm but, sorry. But it, no, but it's true. It's true. It's And it's something that I tell, I tell students and I tell my friends who are struggling with their writing, we all give each other the same pep talk. Yeah. And it it's, it really just is about trusting the process. Like the process is a thing that exists outside of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you've written other books. Like this isn't like your first attempt. This is your third novel. Yeah. I feel like with every book though, I'm setting myself sort of a, a new challenge, like teaching myself a new skill set because my first book I was you know, teaching myself how to write linked essays. My second book, I was teaching myself how to write a novel. And my third book, this book, the main thing that I feel like I taught myself how to do in this book is how to work with a longer time frame. Mm -hmm. Because this book takes place over the course of 15 years. And my first book, I very, very deliberately made it take place over the course of one calendar year. That was I knew that was all I could handle. (laughs) And also the first book has a lot of structure baked into the plot because one of the characters, (laughs) because I like to write about pregnancy, I had not experienced pregnancy when I wrote 
that first book. But pregnancy is a great way to structure a book because it just has a narrative structure built into it. A copy editor did point out to me, though, that one of the characters was pregnant for 11 months. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was a, you know, a fix that had to happen. It's more like an elephant, I guess, than a <laughs> human. <laughs> Do you have a particular affinity for music? Are you, like, super into music? To structure, It was structured around this sort of, like cool new band and Zibi, I think this might totally shock you given that the characters in this book are musicians in the early aughts but in the early aughts I dated a musician <laughs> but other than that I have I really have very little in common with Laura like she biographically is like me in that she moved to New York the same year that I did and lived and lived in the East Village mm-hmm. other than that I think our we're more I feel like I have a lot more in common with Marie, and I gave Marie Mm -hmm. a lot more of my own experiences as the mother, I mean, as the daughter character, because I know what it's like to be a daughter, but I don't know what it's like to have a daughter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the way things are shaping up in this lifetime, I, I never will. So one of the things that I wanted to sort of give myself in this book was like experiencing that in fiction. I don't know. I just, it just seemed like something that I wanted to explore. Mm-hmm. I think especially after I learned that my second child was also a boy, I felt even more sure about like writing about this dynamic that I will never know, probably. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. We'll find out. Uh, Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. I, we always say things like, if we win the lottery or whatever, but like, you know... <sighs> We're pretty much stretched to our max in all kinds of ways right now, especially, you know, with uh, like our older son, Rafi, having such an enormous personality. So, yeah, I'm pretty I'm actually pretty happy with the situation as it is. I don't really I I always have the option of writing more books, you know. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. You can just put them on a shelf. <laughs> yeah. They don't have to, like, go they to college. Talk to you yeah. And, uh, you know, they, yeah. Don't, they don't need their own room. No, they. you don't have to, like, buy a larger car. Yeah. Yeah. We're, like, the car situation with four kids. Like, you, you know, I, we're, like, constantly, like, there just isn't a big enough car. You'd like a freaking truck. Anyway. Yeah, a VW like bus, like bus or something. Or something. Yeah. yeah. That'd be cute, though. It would be cute. I couldn't park it anywhere, but, you know, I can't park anyway, so... <laughs> Fair enough. So in this book, you do have an interesting thing happen, which is that Laura has to deal with Dylan's death in the context of the wider national mourning for 9-11, which happens at the same time. And you wrote, she passed fading posters on lampposts that people had put up looking for their lost relatives and friends with blurry color photocopies, photocopied photographs. She wished that she could mourn with all the other mourners. Maybe then her burden wouldn't feel so huge. When she caught herself weeping silent tears while walking down the street, she knew that people assumed that she was crying for one of the other dead people. And again, she felt like a liar. So where did this come from? Did you have a loss over 9-11? Did you just imagine, have you ever felt sort of like out of step with other people's emotions in the same way? I mean, Laura is so emotionally immature. And she's revealing it in that Mm -hmm. moment. She's so young, Mm -hmm. and she has no idea what the magnitude of 9-11 means to the people who lost someone. And she's experiencing very, like, shitty, selfish emotions Mm -hmm. in that moment. It felt really important to me to be true to Laura as someone who is, like, imperfect and really young, and yet having these really big, challenging life decisions thrust upon her. I mean, a lot of the book is about like Laura figuring out how to grow up Mm -hmm. at the same time that she is becoming a mother. Mm -hmm. My own 9-11 experience informed this part of the book just because I did live in New York at that time. But I was also like a, you know, I was, I'm a little younger than Laura even. So I just remember the process of really sort of like learning over the course of years how childish and how, how incomplete like my generation's like capacity for understanding something of that magnitude really was. But I think it really did shape, I mean, it it shaped my experience of what it was like to live in the city for sure. It, and it also really coincided for me with, this is like a little bit weird to say, but I think, I think a lot of people had this experience too of really deciding that they wanted to live in New York forever and like, and really like falling in love with the city because, you know, it was a moment of really seeing people at their best and really seeing people like care about, 
care about strangers and care about people that they didn't know. And that was really special and really unique. And in some ways, I got to experience some of that again after Hurricane Sandy. That was another time that I felt like New Yorkers really came together. And doing volunteer work after Hurricane Sandy was another time that I... That was a time that I was able to, as an older person, like make some emotional sense of what that experience, you know, with my like Laura-esque naivete had had been like. Yeah, it was a, I mean, anyway, <laughs> I just, sorry, like asking someone about their 9-11 story is like a little bit like asking someone about like a dream they had because like everyone has one, but it's like most people's are pretty boring. <laughs> anyway, I will spare you. You don't have to spare me. Oh, well, it's, I mean, it was actually such a crazy time because I met this woman who had been one of my like writer idols. I was going out to Stony Brook, Long Island to see, meet her for the first time and interview to be her assistant, this cartoonist and author, Phoebe Glockner, who is just an amazing, super genius. And I ended up spending the next three days at her house because trains weren't running back to the city. So we really got to know each other and I really got to know her family in this like maximally intense and crazy time. But I was I was such a kid. I mean, I was 19, but like I didn't even realize at first the first thing that I should do when I got off the train is like call my mom and reassure her that I was okay. Like it didn't even occur to me. <laughs> you know, I feel like you're being kind of hard on yourself because you actually were a kid. I mean, yeah, no, I you, it's not <laughs> like you were acting childish, but you were 45. You were, you were young. And sometimes, like you're saying, like you maybe just didn't have, like you just had, your brain had not gotten to a point. Yeah, where no, it it's could, true. Your you know? like frontal cortex yeah, exactly. is actually exactly. not fully formed at that point. But it's it's interesting to me as a novelist to think about like the the ways that young people can be very like fully formed and then the ways that we are still so incomplete. That's true. And I thought about that a lot when I was writing this book too. You recently wrote an essay called Replaying My Shame for the Cut in which you talk about the experience of being interviewed by Jimmy Kimmel on Larry King Live and being unexpectedly thrust into a situation where you had to defend your role as Gawker's editor and writer and the map of celebrities and how they felt about whether or not that was a safe thing to do. If you were putting celebrities at risk, you had to go on the defensive and were completely sort of blindsided by where the interview was going, which was all caught on TV and now on YouTube and all this stuff lives forever. And after that, you had to have a period of complete like defending yourself and soul searching and whatever. And then you just wrote this essay now, like last month, about how that whole thing affected you going forward, everything from your bubblegum pink suit to from the vintage store to how you deal with it now and how it keeps coming up even if you don't want it to come up. I did not even know all this happened to you. I, I just read your book and I was like, oh, I wonder what, and I'm like, oh, good. I was like, well, I'm glad I Googled her because this is like a really interesting experience you had at a young age when things were unregulated in the like blogger space really. And you were sort of left out to dry. And now you've revisited it as like a mature older person and wrote about it. So I was just wondering what made you write this article now, maybe related to this book or what have you thought about it as the years have passed being in that situation and being thrust into that uncomfortableness that ensued? So for me, I think, you know, clearly this has been a strange 15 years in terms of media, the media landscape, the global shifts in who has power and how that power is distributed and how we get our news, how we get our information. And I was there for this historical moment. And I've also seen it being reframed over and over again by other people. And instead of being caught up in someone else's narrative of this job that I had at this early stage of my career, at the very beginning of my career, I wanted to just tell my version of the story, that tell people what my experience of this has been like and how it's shaped me. And it felt it felt important to me to write it. And I did my best. No, it was great. I mean, I mean, you just did, like, I wanted a whole book about that. I mean, honestly. It's funny, when I first started working on it, I actually thought that I would write a whole book about shame, mm-hmm. and or that 
you know, that shame would be the sort of like key that unlocked a lot of different themes and that I would continue to do essays on that at theme. Some of them like researched and reported and, you know, really digging deep into what shame has meant for a lot of people, not just myself. And then after I worked on this essay for seven months, I was like, oh my God, no. <laughs> I really really feel so done with this. So, and I really just, that was another thing that it, that it turned out that I wanted by the end of this process. I was like, this is published. Mm -hmm. This is what I feel right now. You know, I like to never say never about anything clearly. I never like to fully close the door, but it feels to me right now, like this is the last time that I will ever write about this stuff. And now I can just sort of like move on from it to the extent that that is possible because it's not, like, as I had said in the essay, it's not totally up to me. Right. You know, no matter how many books I write, no matter how many books I, of other people's I'm able to publish, no matter what teaching job I get, you know, it's always going to be this thing that's in, like, the first paragraph of my bio, you know? And I have to— and I didn't put it in your bio. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Just so you know, I, it's I, not even in there. Oh it's my god! Not even I was doing another. I was doing, I was doing another interview recently, and the way that we ended up talking about it somehow, I don't remember whether I brought this up or whether the interviewer brought this up. But the way that we ended up talking about it was whether it would be the in the first few sentences of my obituary when I die. Yeah, but you know, life life is long. Who knows what will happen in the next several decades of my life. Maybe I'll only be known as like Raphael Gessen Gould's mom, you know? Maybe mm -hmm. he'll go on to be like a global yeah. pop sensation. And I'll just be like, oh yeah, his like Emily, his mom. Totally. I think she was a journalist or a writer or something. My goal is just to have an obituary written about me. I'm like, do you think they'll write one? Oh, I was so vain. I'm like, oh, it's a foregone conclusion. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's probably I'm for not, you. I'm, you not, I'm not saying it will be like above the fold or anything. <laughs> or like in the, I mean, it'll just be like tucked away in some like obituary section. But yeah, like, you know, <laughs> come on. Written a few books. Oh, like, we, uh, we, you'll never know. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> oh, that is such a good thing to meditate on. I <laughs> like, yeah, you'll, yeah. You, and you don't feel bad or good about it. It's just, it is what it is. Yeah, <laughs> fully. That's reassuring, actually. Yay. Good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, I, I like go down such a dark hole about like my whole death and like, I'm like, I want to write the speech that people read. I want to like organize it. I want to have like the whole thing planned. I want to like, you know, be in charge. I want to know exactly who's going to talk. Like, and so every so often I like rewrite like notes. And I know I'm like ridiculous. <laughs> okay, that's legit crazy. I know, I know. Yeah. I know. Although it's better than being totally unprepared. I like to plan for everything. Yeah, I, oh my God, we had this like rent a rabbi when my grandfather died. He was the first of my grandparents to die. And he got his name wrong. It was horrible. It was horrible. I, yeah, that that was like a moment for me of being like, I should really... I get there. <laughs> yeah, like at least do a playlist, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, now that we've got to think about our deaths today, again, in another context. <laughs> it's, it's before noon, but we went there. What do you want out of life now? You're writing this great book. <laughs> like, what comes next for you? Like, what else do you need to do? You've written all these books. Like, you've influenced so much. Wait, I also want to hear more about your imprint. Tell me about the publishing and business that you were doing. Oh, with yeah. The imprint of Coffee House Press, well, Emily's books. It's actually really an exciting time for us because our next book in the imprint comes out. It came out this week, actually. Hilary Leichner's book, Temporary. It just got a rave in the New York Times. Maybe you should have her on your show. Maybe I should. Look <laughs> she, me up. She's lovely. Yeah. And we love this book so much. I'm so excited for people to get their hands on it. It's actually already going into its second printing, which Amazing. is like really like a huge deal for an independently published book. Yeah. So, so how many books do you publish a year? We were just publishing two a year. And only by women? Yeah, like women and gender nonconforming people. We started as a book of the month club. And so we were doing just a book pick every month and distributing mm -hmm. them as eBooks. Yep. And then we started in collaboration with Coffee House Press, which is a small press that's actually located in Minneapolis. Um, we started at publishing books as an imprint of Coffee House. And is that amazing? Like, do you love it? No. Okay, careful. Okay, let me uh, let me refer, let me let me just say that again. So, are you enjoying that? Do you enjoy your your role as a publisher? Yeah, I've loved it. I mean, publishing is my first 
job ever was in book publishing. So I feel like it's this thing that I'm always going to be really interested in. Sadly, bittersweetly, Temporary is the last book that we have lined up right now. The project has sort of run its course in some ways. It's it's complicated because I think, you know, we've really done what we wanted to do with it. And we're seeing now that a lot of the books that have some of the same themes and some of the same sort of like formal qualities of the books that we have been championing and publishing for years are now being published by the big five presses, which is great. And it's like great news for these authors. But for us, you know, we sort of felt like what we can do as a small press is like really, really limited. And we're always going to have a hard time saying to authors like, oh, you should take less money to be published independently. You know, like it got harder and harder to make that make sense. And also just for me and my best friend, Ruth, who I've been running this business with for years, we wanted to take some time for the other parts of our careers, for me, writing, teaching, everything else that I do, and for her writing and editing books that aren't, you know, necessarily books for a small press. Mm. So, yeah. And like ma- and like making money also is something that we need to do more of. And as much as we have loved doing this passion project, you know, like we were running low on passion, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> like after after a while it became this this thing where we we're sort of like dredging the last bits of passion from the passion well and we wanted to quit doing it while we still had any left, you know. That makes sense. Right? I love that. There should be a whole thing on like when passion, like when passion runs out of your passion project, what do you do? Yeah. Like you should profile like all these different, I'll I, let you write that. Yeah, no, I, I think, well, I mean, I think it does, <laughs> because I think it does happen pretty often and people have a hard time, you know, it's like the end of a relationship. You're like, when is the day that you want to wake up and blow up your life? Oh. But sometimes it needs to happen. And I am really scared because I have no idea what's next. But I just know that I need to, like, make space for whatever whatever the next thing is to come into my life. Not to sound like a hippie wellness guru, but no. I think it's true. Yeah. Sometimes you do need to make the space before you know what's going to occupy it. It's true. Do you have any advice to aspiring authors? Oh, huh, gosh. Like, don't do any of the stuff that I did, basically. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. I You're guess. so sweet. This is the question that, like, every author gets a thousand times. I know. I'm trying to be really, like, <laughs> genuine and sincere I about love that it. You're, pre- you're, you're like, like, taking it seriously. As I'm like, <laughs> no, like, what, I mean. Like, you didn't see it coming. You're, no, I'm kidding. No, I'm I, you. yeah, like, I mean, I think that, I think the answer that everyone probably gives is just, like, constantly be reading and read a lot, right? But don't give that one then. Yeah. It's a good one, though. I mean. Okay, fine. Yeah. All right, I'll take it. Well, because, like, having books be so fully in every single part of my life, and I'm also married to a writer, so, like, really the books are just, like, everywhere coming at me from all sides. And sometimes it does get difficult, and I'm sure you experience this, too, to realize that books are actually this amazing technology that we have for transmitting one person's consciousness into another person's consciousness. And it's the best way of doing that that humans have come up with. And it's this amazing miracle. And sometimes, like, hitting, like, hard restart on my, like, reading and writing life involves, for me, like, going back to a book that I love and realizing why books were ever important to me in the first place. So I think, like, that's good stock advice for writers, right? Like to sort of get back in touch with why you ever cared about this and what, like, you know, so that it can like have meaning because it's it's increasingly hard, I think, right now at this historical moment to figure out like what we can do every day with our lives to find some sense and meaning in like the increasingly chaotic world that we live in. Anyway, the book that I'm rereading right now is The Age of Innocence. There's a new edition of it that just came out with a fabulous new introduction and foreword. And I'm just loving it so, 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 so much. It just gets like richer and more interesting every time I read it. Awesome. Okay, well, I have to say goodbye so I can eat something so my stomach stops growling like this. (laughs) Totally totally fair. Can everybody hear my stomach like on these microphones? No. Anyway, get get that snack. (laughs) Thank you so much for coming on the show. And I loved your book. It was great.
Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for reading. You've been listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books with Zibby Owens. Please make sure to sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com to get more updates about episodes like these and also lots of live events. Thanks for listening. Thanks again to Peeled Snacks for being a sponsor of this week's episodes. Peeled Snacks, again, discount code ZIBBY15, capital Z, ZIBBY15, uh, for 15% off your purchase for this week only. And go check out the wefoundtime.com essay They're so good and uh, they'll make you laugh and think and feel and, and all the good things. Have a great week. You can follow me on Instagram at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thanks for listening. You could always email me at zibby at zibbyowens.com. 